Is it me, or is the big release period starting to pull a reverse Christmas, that is to say getting later every year? If all you want is ports of stuff we already know is good, then your quid's in right now, Lieutenant Lags Behind. Resident Evil 4, Dead Rising 1 and 2, and the Bioshock collection are all out on Expo and Pisspoor this week. You'd almost think AAA publishers have become a bit risk-averse. Surely not, they've always seemed like such sprightly and adventurous enormous bloated mounds of fat and bloodstained money. There's that new World of Warcraft expansion that YouTube ads seem to think is terribly important I hear about every hour of the fucking day, but frankly I feel like I could have a more profitable time stacking coins on a railroad track. So as always we turn to Steam, the ever-flowing cornucopia of RPG Maker games and pixel art, and this week we'll be looking at two newborns that have cut their mouths on the jagged edges of the pixel art pacifier, starting with The Curious Expedition, a procedural explorer map developed by two blokes who worked on Spec Ops The Line, which doesn't count for much as a selling point because a fly that buzzed into the office and shat on the gold master technically worked on Spec Ops The Line. It also shouldn't be taken as an indicator of content, because while sharing the loose theme of barging into someone else's country to, in academic terms, shit it the fuck up, there's much less horrifying gazes into the abyss of the human soul and far more gleeful nicking valuables from primitive natives in the jolly spirit of 19th century colonialism. You play one of a selection of real-life Victorian figures, and incidentally I've learned to be slightly wary of any game in which Nikola Tesla is a character, the patron saint of socially awkward tech nerds, as they compete with their peers to map out unexplored lands and loot the place. And I did find it slightly hilarious that one of the playable characters is H.P. Lovecraft. That dude never left the house, and thought Jews and black people evolved from jumping spiders and dog turds, so casting him as an explorer is like casting 50 Cent as Miss Marple. So what we have is the kind of roguelike that has the feel of a pen and paper roleplay playing session conducted by a DM with very little imagination. You have found a village of natives, they dress and act identically to the natives you met in your last expedition to an entirely different continent, and seem to be aware of what a bunch of dicks you were to them, but then Darkest Africa gets a surprisingly good Wi-Fi signal. You might find the curious expedition a wee bit uninvolving, since most of the action is described with pure text, except for the combat where the characters are on screen, far away in the distance in tiny whiny pixel vision, where every single action from attacking to being attacked to having an earnest conversation about the excesses of European colonialism is conveyed by having the character hop into the air a bit. But isn't that in keeping with the spirit? of things, our sense of distance from proceedings echoing the sense of detachment our adventuring heroes have from their own actions as they steal treasure and corrupt the natives in arbitrary pursuit of personal glory? Probably not, actually. Have you noticed that this game is called The Curious Expedition, rather than The Curious Expeditions? Which might have been more honest since a standard campaign involves locking yourself into six successive adventures, but it turns out the title was accurate all along since this is really six repeats of the same adventure. You land, you collect a few colourful diseases and you find a golden pyramid. It's like reading King Solomon's Mind six times with the pages slightly shuffled around. And while we're on the subject, Surely Ryder Haggard would have been a more fitting novelist character than Lovecraft, but then I suppose he wouldn't have gotten the instant nerd cred one gets from mouthing Cthulhu and chummily waggling your eyebrows. There's yet to exist a game with truly infinite replayability, except that one game where you fire an electrode into the pleasure centre of your brain until you starve to death, but sadly that hasn't yet been ported from Laboratory Rats, the lucky bastards. In the meantime, the last ability of a procedural game lives or dies on variety, especially if the focus is on story over gameplay challenge, and I just don't think there's enough. You have desecrated my temple, now I shall scourge the land with- oh, floods or volcanoes this time. Yornorama, freshen up your material, Tezcatlipoca, mate. So let's turn our back on going to foreign countries and shitting them the fuck up, and for a nice change of scene, play a game about going to one specific foreign country and shitting it the fuck up, in Mother Russia Bleeds, a new game published by Devolver Digital, which is best summarised by saying it is a Devolver Digital game. It has the quintessence of such in that it's horrifying gore and extremity depicted in brightly coloured pixel art, like getting bloodily raped to death in the prison showers by an enormous skinhead made of Lego. Mother Russia Bleeds is a retro-style arcade beat-em-up in the final street fights of Rage Mold, where half the challenge is not standing one pixel too far north of your intended targets that your frenzied punches upset northward passing moths, and the other half is mashing buttons in the vain superstitious hope that it'll somehow make you stand up faster. You are part of a Roma community in 1980s Russia whose simple carefree life of brutal cage fighting with the homeless is shattered when you're kidnapped and subjected to drug experiments by Russian gangsters, prompting a quest for revenge. Which is a bit of an overreaction, there are westerners who'd pay good money for weekend breaks like that. Eventually you get caught up in revolution against the corrupt government, because that's all that ever happens in Russia, isn't it? Drug crime, government corruption and revolutions. Why don't we ever hear about the positive things, like their lovely beetroot soup. Anyway, in the grand tradition of arcade beat-em-ups you have four characters to choose from, the fast weak one, the slow strong one, the in-betweeny one, and the other one for when your mum says you have to let your little brother join in. Not that it makes much difference, they all have the same moves and dialogue, which feels like a missed opportunity. Maybe I want to know if the dude in workout gear with bandaged fists and starey eyes has a more nuanced attitude to proceedings than the girl in workout gear with bandaged fists and starey eyes, but we're not here for story, which is probably for the best because the dialogue's consistently as stiff and redundant as a beached whale at optimal surfing time. As I say, the combat that's pretty basic, and I did get rather over-reliant on the sliding tackle, spending more time on my back than an nymphomaniac skirting board inspector, but the challenge is meaty enough and it's certainly cathartic. Blows land with the satisfying crunch of a big-bottomed lady sitting down on a taco platter and with roughly the same effect upon the face of the target, and enough broken teeth litter the ground that the council won't need to grit the pavement next time there's icy weather. I appreciate the subversive joke inherent in depicting such unflinching grittiness as something as comparatively wholesome as an 80s arcade brawler. It's like the Saturday morning cartoon version of Hobo with a Shotgun, and it's the extremes it goes to that make it fun. If we're gonna smash the few 
remaining teeth out of a drug-addicted whore might as well do it with a severed cock sticking out of an overdue library book.